Welcome back. Good to have you with us here on WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. We're talking about us today, Kentucky, and the many things to uh, see and do with Kentucky's Commissioner of Travel and Tourism, Kristen Branscombe, and we'll continue. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I was just asking, summer is the biggest season for travel. This is uh, kind of when you have to uh, catch the fish, isn't it? Oh, it is. <laughs> uh, summer is huge for us, uh, really starting with Memorial Day on, but a lot of people forget about the fall. Fall is huge in Kentucky, especially for our fall colors. Uh, the East Coast, they really market uh, their fall foliage, but it's very expensive. So a lot of people come over to Kentucky, experience the beautiful colors of fall, and uh, our state parks do a fantastic job during that time. Uh, tell us a little bit about the state parks, where they are at this point. Of, they were the model of the nation, certainly in the 1960s when they were being developed and so forth. It's expensive to run them. There's been talk of privatization of some uh, elements of them and so forth. Uh, where are things going there? I think that, uh, I mean, it's been discussed that, you know, we got an emergency appropriation for our state parks to do some uh, safety upgrades, which I think were imperative given some of the issues that have happened with a couple of parks for the last couple of months. Uh, but I believe that, you know, the, our parks didn't get into the state that they are overnight. And so I think there is a lot of long-term planning uh, to make sure that they once again become the nation's finest. Uh, there's there's some parks out there that are just absolutely gorgeous, but you know they they need some upgrades, they need some paint, and some are a, a little, little bit of a Back to the Future look. It's uh, a, a little <laughs> bit, but you know that's but but, uh, but yeah, but beautiful locations where they are. Right. Uh, the the visitors today and travelers today expect a lot more than what uh, we prepared for. You know, maybe back in the 70s and 80s, and we we like to market some of our parks as a state or a place to unplug. Uh, you know, you may not be able to take all your calls or get off. You know, get Wi-Fi. Uh, and we are, th that's good for some people, but a lot of people come, first thing they do is get that phone and get their Wi Fi connection. So there are just things that, uh, a lot of things to do and, and we're planning for. You know, we, we talk about marketing the state and you talk about uh, obviously buying ads and, and, and getting the info out in that way, but there's also what you call earned media. Uh, those good stories that if you get folks to come here and look, and of course the Derby it comes with some magnificent uh, publicity uh, that, that goes out, but there's also uh, your, under your office is the film office, right? And, yes. Uh, so we, we're oftentimes shooting a movie around here. We are. Uh, we have one that's uh, in the state right now and uh, a lot of people uh, of Game of Thrones fans uh, they recognize Amelia Clark uh, as Khaleesi she's uh, going to be in town filming and you know it's a bigger budget film based on a true story of an FBI agent uh, in, in Pikeville and so uh, it's very exciting we see a lot of people on Twitter and, and Facebook uh, taking f pictures of set and you know kind of cool to have stars here but you know while that's nice and glamorous the film industry uh, we are just at the tip of the iceberg of what we can do here in Kentucky. A lot of states uh, surrounding us that have been major film meccas for several years, they have either had sunset clauses or new administrations that have cut their film incentives. So we are only second to Georgia in the nation uh, as far as film incentives. So we are right there at top of mind. So I think you're going to see a lot from Kentucky in the film industry to come. And with that brings uh, more jobs, it brings production facilities. So it's more than just seeing some stars, you know, walking down downtown yeah. Lexington. Uh, this is also economic development and workforce development. So we're very excited about that. Brings a lot of attention as well. That's uh, yes. <laughs> most importantly maybe, right? Yeah. Well, like you said, it puts Kentucky in a, a positive light and it's something that uh, it, it's good for us all. And it's good for our communities. You know, you talk about some of our smaller communities, things you never think of. Of what what do drag, drag cleaners make? How about banks in these communities? You know, you have a film coming in for weeks at a time, yep. and uh, it's just it's a big economic driver all the way around. You see the bourbon industry continuing to to grow and, and drive uh, tourism. I do. Uh, you know, I think everyone was wanting to see kind of will bourbon max out? You know, where is this cyclical cycle? And we see nothing that indicates anything but going up, up, and up. So. Uh, you know, Bardstown, in a matter of two weeks, broke ground on two new distilleries. So we're still producing, and I, th I think it's fantastic, and people are still interested, and in, in not so much maybe about the bourbon itself, and I think that's where some people in the spirits industry, it's, you know, about vodka one year, rum one year. This is about the craftsmanship and the history that goes along with bourbon. So I think that's something that we will never lose, and bourbon will still be cool. Do you see that footprint uh, maybe enlarging uh, into some other areas of the state uh, in terms of uh, maybe craft breweries and, and some other things as 
the laws have been uh, by the own the choices of some of those local communities uh, those some of those areas are now opened up yes I definitely think you know we see uh, you know in Paducah they have one of uh, they were named one of the nation's best bourbon bars uh, the freight house restaurant down there so there's interest in Paducah you know Pikeville they're they're Pierce Lyons and Alltech, they're doing a distillery down there. So I think we see smaller ones starting to pop up, but I think we have opportunity for craft breweries and distilleries to be throughout the state. All right, sometimes we Kentuckians don't get out and see our own state. What are some things uh, people uh, should uh, consider this summer? Well, if you're looking for something to do, I would invite everybody get to go to KentuckyTourism.com. We have a new promotion starting on Memorial Day, 99 days of summer. So every day from Memorial Day to Labor Day, uh, there will be activities, new activities for you to see on our website to help plan a trip. And it's everything from a festival to National Ice Cream Day to National Hiking Day, Bourbon Day. So we tried to put it with all these fun activities that are already going on, but to give you something that uh, you can do that wide variety of interests. Yeah. Something for everyone. Get out and see your own state. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Commissioner, thank you so much. Commissioner Kristen Branscombe of uh, Travel and Tourism. We appreciate it very right. much. Thank you so much. We hope you'll keep it here on WKYT and Kentucky Newsmakers. A former member of Parliament joins us. Uh, give us his take as he visits Kentucky in just a moment. Welcome back to WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. Our guests here are many times very familiar to you, the movers and shakers who get things done in Kentucky. But today we get a view from across the pond from a former member of the British Parliament who is visiting here in the Bluegrass State. Colin Bergen served in Parliament from 1997 until he stepped down in 2010. He's still active in Labor Party politics, and his nephew, Richard Bergen, is a current member of the Parliament. We want to welcome Colin. Good to see you, and thanks for coming by. Great to see you as well. Appreciate it very much. Yeah. So, as you've traveled in Kentucky and here in the United States and kind of listened to people, uh, uh, does it surprise you that some of the same issues in your country are uh, what is being talked about here? Absolutely. <clears throat> it's quite interesting, Bill, really, because the area I come from in the north of England is very, very similar in terms of the economic base and the economic problems that uh, you're facing in Kentucky and large parts of the United States. So, it is uncanny. It's uncanny the kind of concerns that people in Kentucky and other states in the United States have got, and the people you know in the north of England that I come from as well. You uh, have been involved in trying to uh, uh, reinvent the economy in your area, there, yeah. where some of the old industrial jobs are gone. Here in Kentucky, uh, we have the loss of the coal jobs and so mm. forth. That isn't the other kind of similarity you're hearing. Well, a few weeks ago, um, the actual last deep mine coal operation in England closed. So Britain, which had hundreds and hundreds of coal mines, that even within the last 10, 15, 20 years, has now ceased the production of coal. And how you transition from that kind of economy, which gave reasonably well-paid jobs, you know, reasonably secure, how you transition from that is a real big problem that's facing regions like mine and certainly facing regions in the United States as well. Any novel ideas from uh, across the pond? Well, if I had them, I'd keep them to myself because <laughs> it would be worth billions of dollars. <laughs> but the, basically, what, what is happening, and I see it in, very much in Kentucky and other states, there's a, a, an emphasis on the creation of kind of activity around universities to try and generate new ideas about a uh, new economy. But I, I will just add a caveat. What we've never got to forget is that ordinary working class people have got to be included in any new schemes for people. And I often feel in my heart that the ordinary working class people are quite often left out of the equation. You feel like their voices are not heard. I do, and I think that I sense a great uh, detachment in the region I come from, and I also pick it up in America that there's a growing uh, disenchantment with the process. People feel left out that their voices are not heard, and that can give rise to all kinds of issues and outcomes. Well, what is the, the level of interest in your country uh, about what is going on in this country in this lively presidential year that, uh, that we have here? That's a good way of expressing it, a lively <laughs> presidential <laughs> premise. Well, how shall I put this? Uh, our country reflects yours that the vast majority of people just plug into the news occasionally and pick up headlines and whatever. And you have a small group of people around the media and the political class who follow things really, really closely. But I have never known as much interest in what is happening in America 
as as is in this present process of the primaries, huge to use somebody's phrase, a huge interest uh, in uh, in Britain, certainly among people I know. Is there a feeling there that as America goes, so goes a lot of the world to some extent? Oh, I mean, America's position may be, how shall I say, not as numero uno as it used to be, but it's still the primary power. So certainly in Europe and certainly in Britain, we look to America and follow events in America very, very closely. You're still active in the Labour Party politics. The newly elected mayor of London, the city's first Muslim mayor, uh, he and one of the presidential candidates in this country, Donald Trump, have had some uh, some back and forth. Uh, what's the reaction in Britain to, to that? Well, <clears throat> you mean the wider reaction. First of all, um, religion doesn't quite play the same role in British and European politics as it does in America, so we have to factor that in. As regards the spat between Mr. Trump and Sadiq Khan, I think it's a bit of a frothy, you know, frothy issue. Um, however, it, it, it does play into the view that the elites have got in Europe that Mr. Trump is not a sensible candidate or a serious candidate. I, I take issue with that. I think he represents some deep deep kind of fundamental concerns within American society. So I don't write him off in the way that many people do. Uh, as luck would have it, you're here at a very timely uh, time in yeah. your country as well with that uh, European Union vote coming up on June 23rd. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what's going to happen there? What will it mean? Um, there's a huge, huge debate going on in Britain about whether Britain should remain in the European Union. As you quite correctly said, Bill, that vote is on the June the 23rd. I think the vote will be very close. Um, I'm not into the world of predictions, um, but I think it may well be that on the day the remain, i.e. those who are saying we should remain in the European Union, will probably win by a small margin. But I think the debate about our place in Europe and our place in the world will definitely go on after that. But it's a, it is a very big debate. Americans have a, a, a somewhat a fairy tale fascination with the British royalty and the monarchy. Uh, is it important in present day England uh, as we, you know, you would, in Kentucky, and we, the previous guest here talked about tourism and mm. how our state is so known by the Kentucky Derby. Mm. Well, I mean, t here we know England by the monarchy. Yeah. Um, the, the, the monarchy went through a really bad period with the death of uh, Lady Diana. And if you looked at the polling, the popularity of the monarchy dipped really tremendously. Uh, now the Queen's in her kind of 90th birthday. What has happened is the popularity of the royal family, especially the Queen, not necessarily all the other members of the royal family, has been restored. I have to say, for a, probably a minority of us, the obsession with the royal family and the various hangers on is not our central concern, but we understand it's a kind of great tool for um, promoting tourism. How important is it that the United States and England remain uh, very engaged with each other and have a, a, a united front uh, and bring other allies along uh, in the world? Well, that's always been, I mean, we talk about the transatlantic alliance, a special relationship. And I realise that as Britain becomes economically weaker in the overall scheme of things, and that America looks to, you know, acro across to Asia and other powers in Europe, that that may be weakened. But there's no doubt about it, the, and I found it in, in Kentucky, even though we share a common language that sometimes we don't quite understand each other with certain words, that, that common language, common history, I don't, I don't think will ever be altered. What have you enjoyed most about Kentucky? The people. They are absolutely brilliant, uh, so friendly, and everybody seems to know each other. Uh, and uh, it's amazing wherever you go, there's, do you know so? And people just seem to know everybody else. I think a wonderful set of people. Well, we appreciate you coming by. I and, loved uh, hope it. you enjoy the rest of your uh, trip Thank you, here man. to uh, the United States and uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, Kentucky, especially. You, you plan to visit uh, again? Uh, I shall be, I'm in full demand to come back again. I'd love to come back. Well, we appreciate you very much. Thank Thanks you very for much. Being here. I want to thank you for joining us for this edition of Kentucky Newsmakers on WKYT. We'll have continuously updated news on WKYT.com. Of course, our newscasts are coming up as well here uh, on WKYT, and we hope you have a very safe Memorial Day weekend and a good week ahead.